Good evening. This is Tal Schnell here with Lead with Giants TV. I'm joined here this evening uh, with Dan and Sherry, and our guest today is Judith Glazer. Good, good evening, I should say. I know it's uh, afternoon in some places, but how are you, Judith? I'm good, and it is evening here for sure. All right, and you are in uh, Connecticut, right? I am. I'm in Connecticut today. Yep. All right. Well, we're, we're actually uh, honored to have you here. Uh, and we'll uh, obviously chat about different leadership topic, but first I want to go around the room real quick and have everybody introduce themselves. So let's start with Dan. I will introduce myself in a second. Uh, we've had a lot of technical issues, so everybody has been bearing with us. Tal, uh, don't forget if you are got to put people up in the big screen because I forget that sometimes when I'm on air. Yes. And uh, Judith, um, would you spell your name, uh, the spelling of your last name, because we weren't able to get your banner there? So how about spelling sure. your name for everybody? Sure. My last name is Glazer, G-L-A-S-E-R, Glazer. Sure. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, I'm Dan Forbes. I am founder of the League with Giants community, which spans Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, Facebook, and whoever else wants to come out with a new social media platform. And I'm hanging from Sarasota, Florida this evening. And how do you spell your last name? Forbes, <laughs> like the magazine. <laughs> Just Forbes, kidding. like the magazine, but no relation, unfortunately. All right. We, we thought there was a connection there. Uh, <laughs> Sherry, go right ahead. Where are you hanging Hi. from? Hi. Uh, I'm Sherry Esner. I'm hailing to you from very, very cold Toronto. And um, I am so excited to be here with Judith. Um, I also promote uh, taking uh, you from me to we, so Judith and I have a lot in common, so this should be great. Terrific. Great, great. Well, we're looking forward to this conversation. Judith and I spoke uh, just a few weeks ago, we literally exchanged a lot of emails, but uh, you know, I came across some of her material years ago, and we'll talk about that, but we're really excited to have you on the show, Judith. It's just an amazing uh, thing nowadays with having a uh, video hangout and those things out there for technology for us. So it's uh, it's great to connect with you today. It's cool to hang out with you guys too. Terrific. Oh, all right. So for those of you who haven't, uh, who might not know who Judith is, uh, I will introduce her here. Uh, Judith E. Glazer is the CEO of Benchmark Communication Inc. and the chairman of the Creating We Institute. She's one of the most innovative, innovative and pioneering change agents, consultants, and executive coaches in the consulting industry. Judith is the author of six books and an animated film on leadership. Three of her books are bestsellers, including Creating We, Change I Thinking to We Thinking, and Build a Healthy, Thriving Organization, The DNA of Leadership, and 42 Rules for Creating We. Most recently, Judith authored the book, Conversational Intelligence, How Great Leaders Build Trust and Get Extraordinary Results. So my first question is, um, there is a, a really big shift now, probably picking up in a fast speed in many organizations, moving from what you termed actually almost a decade ago, if you will, very revolutionary at the time, and I don't know if many people paid attention back then in 2005 when your book came out, mm -hmm. but do you think now, more than any other time, you see organizations thrive and building up that engagement of a we culture? So what, when I came up with these terms, it was over a decade ago. In fact, um, the work that I've been doing, this research, has been going on for about four decades. And what I started to realize is that the world was making a shift from I to we, and uh, we needed a language to enable that shift to take place and for people to anchor themselves to that shift. And so I started to write words that I thought would help build us into this vision of the new world. I actually had a chance to write a dictionary for Random House. That was one of the, I actually now have seven books, um, with the new one, Conversational Intelligence, being the seventh. But my first was a dictionary for Random House. And when I studied this, I realized that if we don't have a word for something, we can't live into it. And so... Mm -hmm. Words like conversational intelligence now, and an example, um, I, I thought it was fascinating when I was doing the dictionary, the word leadership was defined as you know you're a good leader if you have followers. 
Now today, many of us have well be, gone well beyond that to realize that our job as leaders is to develop other leaders and, and followers will not get us where we need to be going in the world. So as I begin, began to think about the instincts that human beings have, um, that there are certain instincts that we need to hone even more effectively and it's the we instincts that are hardwired into our bodies and in fact reside everywhere in our body and that if we create the environments for this we instinct to be triggered by the environments that we're in, the world's going to change. You know, the things we struggle with aren't going to be struggles anymore. And do you think we're, we're changing now as we speak more? Probably there's a lot of, you know, generation, the generation, the millennia that are more into the workspace now. Do you think that that's picking up into more of the we concept now? They are we. They are very much we. And, and aren't they? I mean, truly. They are. Yeah, they are. I, it, it's it's just incredible. It's so hardwired into them. They grew up in a, in a world that where you could have uh, communication with people and at the fingertip, which we never did, as instantaneously as you want it and as often as you want it. And we keep forgetting um, about that. And I know that there were many things when millennials started to be talked about. Uh, people would say they don't respect authority. Um, they're difficult in the workplace. Right? All those kinds of things that were very That's pejorative. Not true. Not yes. true, right. Not true, not true. I'm waiting for them to uh, rock my world. They're so creative and innovative. And uh, I just actually spoke at a college to 20 and 22-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was speaking with them, they were Googling me. Wow. So they're so on the ball. And they are our next, you know, the next generation of leaders. And they think differently than we do because they are defined by a, a, a different generation. Right, a different mindset and I think they're much more aware that they're always connected where we had to work hard hard to become more connected and when you think about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago in the workplace people wanted to connect and to connect they had to be important so that other people would want to connect with them. I mean that's always the case because we're human beings but there, that's why things used to be so much more political is because to get known, to get connected, to be in the circle, a lot more of our ego was driven, was driving our behavior. Where now we're learning that there's a lot other types of connectivity, one human being to another, that doesn't have to be ego driven in the way it used to be the case. What are you experiencing? Well, I think you just touched on, a, as I listen to your answer right now, you touched on a very important thing is that maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was about that person, that leader. But mm -hmm. now, any success of any organization, any anywhere you're going to go, it is really about that we. And maybe if you go back, it was depending on how maybe the CEO of the company or someone who's in the very, maybe it's the manager of the department. And now I think that it is, you're, you can't succeed alone. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't be the expert, if you will. Everybody has to, to contribute. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so we're, we're now beginning to realize this, the idea of a leader supporting the development of other leaders or a leader creating enterprise thinking in the people that report to him was foreign 10 years ago. It was the leader is the center. You have to please the boss. You have to do well, and then you get good reviews, and then you get your bonuses. I mean, it was a very short-sighted... Uh, linkage between the leader and people in the organization. And as you're describing, uh, in a we-centric world, we have to make the enterprise the center or our customers the center and have people work around in networks to help support and build the growth of knowledge and wisdom and, and all of these things that the closer we get to we, the more it seems like it's such a natural way of being. And uh, one of the great things that, uh, speaking here with Dan, Dan created this community and it's a, an example of leadership of a we, I'd like for Dan to speak about that, how, uh, how, we, how we do our leadership in the Google Plus community and, and LinkedIn and Facebook, Lead with Giants community, it is about we, has that vision and philosophy, so if Dan, you'd like to speak about that maybe? Yes, uh, and I think there's a great tie-in here, and, and Judith, heads up, I want to ask you uh, to respond in a moment about what your definition of leadership is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I liked your comment that, you know, the old definition that if you have followers, you're a leader. Mm -hmm. Well, Adolf Hitler had, uh, you know, lots mm -hmm. of followers, and mm -hmm. a lot of followers, or a lot of uh, so-called leaders, political leaders, uh, they force people uh, to follow them. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and in one sense, yeah, they they were a leader. They were bad. <laughs> they were leaders for for evil. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, the idea about com conversations, and I haven't read your book, but I, I certainly will. Uh, the idea about conversations, and I think about uh, social media, how we are surrounded by conversations constantly. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm a little bit obsessed because I, I, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Google+, uh, I'm, on, I'm on LinkedIn, and I, I'm checking in uh, during moments during the day. So I, I actually do work, but if I get up from my desk and I, I, I go to take a break for just a couple of minutes, I'm looking at my smartphone, mm -hmm. and I'm actually, you know, connecting and having conversations with people. Mm -hmm. The Lead with Giants community was born with a mission of helping leaders become better leaders, and so we are connected with all kinds of people, from uh, people who are frontline uh, employees to CEOs of corporations to authors like yourself and 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 many others. Uh, managers, uh, owners of businesses, and that collective wisdom and those collective conversations, I believe, are, are making a difference to those who mm -hmm. are a part of our community. So I think you know the 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 fact that social media is around us and is a part of employees and companies can use that as well. I would imagine is uh, is a part of what you are saying. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that, but that's what came to my mind you know, about conversations. Yeah. Um, so I, I I do want to hear more specifically about the types of conversations. I've heard, you know, I know of CEOs. I'm not going to use a name now, but you know, books have been written by CEOs that said, "Look, I, you know, I uh, started a health uh, program in my company, and I decided to walk around uh, to lose weight. And while I walked around, I started talking with employees." And all of a sudden, we were engaging with one another, and it was transformative to uh, his role as the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, this is exactly what you're saying. But kind yeah. of go back and, and say and ask, uh, you know, what is your definition of leadership, and then how, uh, what do you mean by conversational intelligence? Okay. Um, so I think of leadership or leaders as people who understand how to create the space for organizational growth, for individual growth. Um, and, and so it's not about following, it's about being much more thoughtfully creative about building the space in their enterprise for the highest level of engagement so that everyone can bring their best thinking to play. Um, a leader to do that has to have a lot more humility, as we've learned, than, than ego. They, can't, they have to lead with humility and make themselves approachable. And so I have some great leaders um, in companies that I've worked with who intentionally are mindful when they walk into a room that rather than um, becoming the authority figure and walking in as though they had power over others, that they literally do things like they'll undo their ties, they'll sit down at a table, um, they'll focus on asking questions first before they start to tell what, what they're thinking. And so we've learned that a we-centric leader is a leader that, again, again opens the space for people to have a voice. And that's what I love when I watch that happening. Um, there are many amazing leaders that I've worked with. One, for example, you've heard in the news about Angela Arnst. Angela Arnst was the CEO of Burberry and just recently got hired to join Apple as the CEO of, um, of Apple Global, uh, opening up all different markets. And uh, it didn't matter how many people were in her company. Angela had a way of creating a space where everyone felt that they could reach her and have a conversation with her. And when I would work with her and visit her, it's amazing. I'd walk around the halls and ask people what's going on in the company, and they would reference Angela like she was a friend of theirs. So it's leaders that help build a respectful, um, transformative relationship with employees that they work with and have them feel that they are contributors to building the organization. That's what I consider to be great leaders. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I think absolutely. we can all relate. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I want to say that I, I've been in... Um, in a company, I won't mention the name of it. Uh, I've been in a company where the, um, uh, the 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 leader would walk by and never even acknowledge that you were there. Right, right. And I also remember reading in uh, one of John Maxwell's books where uh, he tells the story of how a CEO uh, sort of called on the carpet another another C level leader. 
who was just walking by people and hurrying to get in his office and start work. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I've got important things to do. And he said, you just walk by the most important thing to do, mm -hmm. and that is engage your people. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that, that um, it, it's not as easy now for a leader to sustain the old style leadership because as a world we're getting so much more mindful of what good leadership is like. And so I know that, um, that I, I mean, I, I'm just so excited about the platform that we're all on now, which is that we have to be more transparent because everybody can find out what's going on anyway. I mean, that mantra for a leader is sharing what's going on in your mind, helping people share what's on their minds. So that you asked what conversational intelligence is, Dan, as the second question. And um, I believe that, that conversations are part of what's hardwired in human beings to enable us to navigate and grow and connect to others. That we used to think as conversations being sharing information. Let me share the information. You can share your information. But that's not what it's about. That's an old way of thinking. Um, came out of the technology time when everything was more industrial. But now we know that conversations take place on three levels. There's a biochemical level, which is where something happens before we're even mindful that it's happening. There's the relational level, where we have emotions with other people and we're relating to them in some fashion. And then there's the co-creational level, where together human beings join forces, think together to create a better world, to bring out a better world. And so if we miss the base level, which is the, the um, neuroscience level. We miss the deep understanding that we're here to learn as we move into a world where conversations are really what drive human behavior. But I'd what, be curious. Yeah. What, what is your best book uh, for me to read? You've written seven. I'm not yep. going to buy all seven of them and read them because my stack is too high. Yep. <laughs> is, it, is it conversational intelligence? Is that the I, one I should be Yeah, doing? this is the one that I've been writing for 50 years. and. Okay. Um, this is the one that got rejected over 30, 40 times by publishers. Oh, it's got to be great then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable how many times I tried to dress this up in all different, I, once I called it um, feng shui at work. Uh, because I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many different names I had for this, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it, they kept saying in the publishing house, people, we won't know what to do with this book because where do you put it? You put it on a book for self, a shelf for self-help in the stores? or a book on science, or a book on leadership, or a book on, you know, where do we put this book? And now the world is saying the integrated sciences, understanding how neuroscience and leadership and culture and, you know, conversations all fit together, we're now trying to connect the dots, not separate them. So it's a, the book, by the way, is a, went into its second printing after two months after it came out. Um, it's now the third most asked for or wished for book on Amazon in the category of, of communications. So, Well, we love the book, and I think in some way it's related to the we-centric culture because you do share uh, in your several articles you've written about the, the we-centric culture. There are seven conversations that leaders can have in their organizations. Walk us through a little bit of those conversations because I think it does tie into your recent book as well, but it yeah. has the we-centric culture in it. Exactly, and this did emanate out of the WeCentric, so I'm glad you brought that up. So what I realized as I was looking through all my research and looking at other people's research is that I started to realize there's seven profound conversations that if leaders understand how to build them into the DNA of their organization, as these conversations get put on the table and the exchange takes place between a leader and people in the organization, it starts to build something at a level that is where everything starts to connect inside of a human being. That may sound funny, but this, these conversations actually build connectivity amongst human beings at a very visceral level. So the first conversation is one about community. Uh, when leaders actually talk about how to become included in the larger community or how to create an inclusive, we center community, and the, teach, the leader speaks to that in their conversations with people and also acts through that, that level, for example, um, sets rules of engagement when they have meetings so everybody feels that they can speak up. Um, they invite people to meetings and, and engage them in um, bringing their ideas out on the table. These are we-centric practices that build a community. So C, I, the, the, each, each uh, of the dimensions has a letter. So C is for community, building a we-centric community, going from I to we. The second is when you have this community, how do people show up? How do they relate to each other? So I use the word humanity that if we relate to each other through respect, 
through being able to um, trust other people, being able to have difficult conversations easily, um, and there are seven dimensions under the humanizing or building relationships with others. So you have community, you have humanity, you have aspirations, which are the first three, and they kind of come together. Human beings build a we-centered culture when we talk about building a future together. And so this third one is aspirations. How do we bring our aspirations to bear in our, in our culture? I, I will share a story with you that I did work with Pfizer, which is a very large organization, and at one point they realized that their performance management systems would ask people to focus mostly on what we expect from others. So mm -hmm. you're performing, right, I mean that's common in, in today's right. world, right? But what we decided to do is do an experiment and change the word from expectations to aspirations and ask people to bring their aspirations to work and when they spoke with their leaders to share aspirations. That one word shifted the culture. I, I don't mm -hmm. know how else to explain to you the power of one word to shift a culture. So when you It say, sounds more positive. It's more positive and it's also personal to, to when, when somebody expects me to do something, with that expectation comes reward or punishment. Right? I expect you to do it. If you do it, I reward you. If I don't, I punish you. We now know that reward and punishment, carrot and stick, demotivates people because you only try to move in the direction of what your boss wants as opposed mm -hmm. to where you can bring greatest value. And so people start right. to lose their identity, right? So, so the first three were kind of how do you set the tone around what it means to be we. Um, the next two are about collaboration and innovation. And so we know that when leaders, believe it or not, the key behind great collaboration that kicks it off in the brain is when people are willing to share what they know and what they do as opposed to withhold it. In right. An, right, in an eye center culture, you're afraid to share because somebody's going to then learn more than you or get better than you. In a we center culture, the more you share, the more you get back. So collaborating through sharing, not withholding, is, is it vital. Uh, the next is innovation. How do we break through current thinking? How do we uh, do more disruptive thinking in organizations? So to get to innovation is to start thinking differently and push back against status quo. So we've almost finished our, uh, our circle of seven conversations and as leaders know how to manage those conversations to create more engagement amongst employees, the more it catalyzes literally at the cell level. It starts mm -hmm. to catalyze a lot more oxytocin which produces more collaboration just instinctively. Um, does that make sense so far? Yeah, I, I want to kind of turn into Sherry now because she a lot of the things that she's doing relate to how you talk about collaboration. So I want to have Sherry maybe uh, share her experience or question. Fabulous. I uh, like I'm I'm just sitting here thinking like we're we're uh, so like you just resonate so much with me because that's exactly what I teach. Wow. And uh, that's exactly um, how I lead as well. Uh, I, I really try and be very we-centric. Mm -hmm. And I found it to be not only a much more positive experience for the people that I'm leading, and really I'm, I'm not really leading them, I'm walking with them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is so uh, gratifying for, my, for me watching people grow mm -hmm. because you've given them the room to be themselves and yeah. you've taken that fear away and uh, I really I, I, I think it's just astounding the results that you can get if you yeah. just make it's, it's a shift it's mm -hmm. not even a big change mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I love about it well, Sherry, you mentioned something about it removes, when you think this way, it, it removes fear in people. Yes. And I think that, that was, that's one of the most powerful things um, that, that, that leaders need to understand and how you brought it out is really terrific. Um, because when you change the culture, you're actually changing, there are two major networks in the brain that get fired off when we're with other people. One is fear networks, which is what you were saying, that you try to diminish them. Right. And the, and the other are the trust networks which is a different part of the brain and if leaders actually realize that that by um, understanding what causes fear activation and what causes the trust networks to be activated just you said it's so magic it's almost like magic right it is, it is. absolutely yeah. and yeah. Uh, when people have those aha moments mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible 
I taught a student who uh, said to me, this was very recently, who said to me, but Sherry, if, ever, if I share what I know, am I not giving away my power? <laughs> and I was, a, I, I, I know that my face said it all, but I was astounded um, that he really felt that way and worked in that kind of an environment. And thro throughout the 12 weeks that I was with him, he and I worked on him losing that and becoming more we centric. Mm -hmm. And he was, he at the end of it told me he was finding he was being more successful at work mm -hmm. than he had before. But he had the old belief you, you must hold it. it, it if, if I give it away, then I've given away my power. Right, right. And um, what, what, what I started to learn more, and maybe you experience this with the people you work with, it, there's something about that dynamic that once a person feels free to exchange more with other people, it actually opens up um, uh, kind of a freedom to explore and to uh, be generative. I don't know if the word generativity ever came up in, in, in people's world. I keep looking for new words that explain <laughs> what, <laughs> what happens. I use that word ten times a day. And I, mean, I thought, no. you know, with no, the name I'm Forbes, <laughs> with the name Forbes, I thought you would do that. <laughs> well, he's he's got the best magazines online, Forbes.com. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, but again, and you know, it's tr so much of this is is um, a key is is enabling people to also trust their voice. Um, the there are two more of the dimensions, and then I want to. Uh, close the loop for people, um, but one of the, the next dimensions in this uh, group of seven conversations is about people having a voice. The, the E gene, which is what I used to call it, each one of these are little DNA genes, is, is having a voice and expressing things. And leaders uh, who can encourage people to speak up and have a voice, not to feel that they should have authority over others, but just like your leader, the, there's this aha, mm -hmm. you know, that if I encourage people to speak up and push back, that I'm doing something to help build a stronger human being and identity. And um, just like going from withholding to sharing, going from dictating to people to developing people's voice, it's, parent, it's like change one thing, change everything. Judith, I want to go back to a, a point that Sherry made because I think you know, I, you know, it's it's there are some people who are holding on to their own knowledge and power and expertise, and and I think they're missing the boat really what leadership is about because. I think of leadership is not how smart you are looking just with your own power, but you have to share your power because there's somebody out there that, you know, contributes to whether it's knowledge or co contribution. I work in the hospitality industry and it's always, you know, you always feed off on other people giving service to other customers and so you're never just that person that can share just their own knowledge and power. So mm -hmm. I think leaders who don't want to share it and they're afraid of giving it away are really missing the boat and at the end of the day they actually gonna look better when someone else is contributing with their own expertise lever they're gonna make you look better. Don't you mm -hmm. think? Yeah. I, I what you said is um, and this is a principle of neuroscience. You said sharing your power is really critical for a leader, right? That mm -hmm. you're putting emphasis on that. We now know that sharing your power releases the instincts for leadership in others. Sharing what you know, yes. right. right? It's it's actually the um, the film that I made, The Leadership uh, Secret of Gregory Goose, that was his big aha, that mm -hmm. the more he shared his power with others and let others take bigger roles in an organization, that's what was releasing the instinct in others to step up and actually have the courage to become right. leaders. So you've nailed right. the, the most important piece of this. Well, I think, you know, you're seeing that within, within our community, for example, is that we thrive on people sharing their ideas about uplifting leadership, engagement, mm -hmm. learning, and leading. And so we have a community of almost about 250 people, but we all feed off one another. There is no one expert on leadership, and so we all share those ideas together. You may have a different experience than me, and so I welcome that, and I think people are, at the end of the day, you can win. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yep. Tal, yep. Where, where have you been on the lead past 250 
long. Two fifty. I'm sorry. Dan is keeping count, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have about a thousand members altogether. I won't. I won't count the ten thousand Twitter followers, but the the thousand members across the uh, uh, the various uh, various platforms. But Tal Tal is a great example. I was uh, doing the video interviews, mm -hmm. and I tapped Tal because he was doing some interviews on his own, and I said, Tal, would you become the Lee with Giants TV mm -hmm. show producer? And, and then later we tapped Andy Lyons, who couldn't be here this evening, to be his co-producer, mm -hmm. and he's been running with us. And I'm not even here all the time, but he's been running with this and doing much more with it than what I could have done. Mm -hmm. And then now Sherry, uh, Sherry's been in the League of Giants community for quite some time, and and we've developed some uh, some some great rapport and talking back and forth. And and uh, Sherry, I've got some ideas for you too. Uh, and and there's others in the community that where I was doing things initially, I invited others to step up become part of a leadership team and they are doing so much more than what I was doing or could do by myself and I love teamwork and, and I believe that's uh, you know uh, uh, essential but you're right you've got to empower others by giving your power away and it just has a multiplier effect right and so often the the next generation doesn't realize what their all, all their talents are they're younger they haven't had an opportunity and when a leader gives them an, like you did gives Tao a chance to step in and and do something he's got that aspiration to do it and now he gets the experience to do it and it's unbelievable it's um when people leave companies uh, for better or for worse and they ask them why did you leave this company um, they often describe two different types of leaders and they say unfortunately I didn't have the one that I wished I had the leader I had is the one that always made sure that that I followed what they were doing and the leader I wished I had was the one that enabled me to step out and challenge myself and try new things that's what you're talking about and the impact on our lives is one leader one person can make all the difference in the world in the way you just described it can change a person's life I want to kind of actually it's a really good transition for us to maybe not necessarily negativity but maybe a toxic um, actually let me rephrase that but challenging conversations many leaders sometimes stay away or resist challenging conversations what is your experience in terms of how to break that ice and and have the courage how can someone have the courage to have those conversations those difficult moments we know they're there how do we how do we do it well, let me ask you before we do in the how that we do it. I want to do a little definition with all of you. Sure. What makes what makes a conversation difficult? What what causes people to be afraid to step into something? And what does that word mean? Difficult, challenging, conflict. What what are the words? I think for me personally, it's uh, you know the consequence. What's going to happen if you say something? You know, how is this person going to react? Is this going to impact the relationship? That's mm -hmm. for me personally, but maybe something different for somebody else. Yes, I'm interested in all of you. Sherry, what's your what's your thinking? Well, I, I actually just had a conversation on Monday night with a team member where I practiced before I got there uh, because it was, um, I, I said, I'm, I'm receiving feedback from the team that you're not engaged. Mm -hmm. And um, she looked at me, she said, just lay it on, out, on, out for me. Uh, I really would like to hear, you know, how I can how I can improve. And I said, that's what I'm here. I told them I failed. I need to support you better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, really, it was a a difficult. It was difficult for me to go and tell her the team is concerned about you. Mm -hmm. And although it turned out great. Yeah, yeah. Um, we often know inside when we're failing. And when people avoid talking about it, we don't get the feedback that we need in order to do something about it. Well, and, she, right. she, she said that to me. She said, Sherry, I knew we were going to have this conversation, but yeah. I am with you. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here in this chair. Right. And I was like, wow, this is great. Isn't this cool? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Go Dan. ahead, Dan. Your turn. <laughs> He's bubbling over. He can't wait to talk. What is it? What is it? <laughs> I, I actually uh, went to a local event this morning. It was uh, a coach who was speaking about having difficult conversations with people. And this is a business uh, networking um, 
organization that usually this monthly morning briefing has maybe 20, 25 people. It was packed mm. today. And it was packed by um, business owners, uh, managers, supervisors, uh, people who find themselves in the role uh, perhaps of having to have a difficult, challenging conversation uh, with an employee generally about you know behavior, uh, not uh, not measuring not measuring up perhaps, and so they were looking for skills and tips and help uh, for having those difficult conversations. So I think there was a big appetite mm -hmm. uh, around that uh, particular topic, and when you think about you know, and that goes to in our homes and in our relationships. Uh, most of us grow up and have the same top conversations that we had, uh, uh, that we heard when we were children, our parents having. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't have the skills, we generally uh, carry those uh, poor skills with us uh, into, our, into our jobs. And even if we get promoted, if we don't learn better, uh, sometimes uh, people carry those uh, negative uh, uh, negative habits uh, all throughout their life. So how does uh, the, uh, conversational intelligence help us uh, learn to have and, and learn to work through uh, difficult conversations as I described? Mm. Um, it, it's the most, I think this is one of the most important things that we need to learn how to do. Um, J Sherry, just like you said and the, like the people that came and just flocked to this session, the more that people learn that these are the conversations that are vital, that are the, what keep us together as human beings, that we've given them the label difficult or fearful because we're all afraid that it might lead to an end of a relationship. But I've now spoken to lots of people around the world and they, they have said to me that if they knew what they know now about how to reframe a conversation that's difficult as one that's the most important for us to have now so that we can continue to grow together. In other words, just cha changing the frame so that it's not it doesn't have fear embedded in it. It's that fright, that feared implication that this relationship is going to end. I would say 99% of the time it doesn't end. In fact, it strengthens a relationship. And those are the stories that people need to hear more about. Seriously, as leaders, if we can share our stories, just like you did, Sherry, of here's an example of what happened in that conversation. The more we hear those stories, the more we're going to be comfortable. I see somebody's picture just showing up. <laughs> you disappeared for a minute. Disappeared. There you go. See yeah, now you now you're learning the intricacies of Google Hangout on here. <laughs> yeah. She had a moment um, of low bandwidth. Yeah. There you go. Uh, it's exactly. a little bit there. there but Judith, go. I wanna I wanna kind of you know get us to the actually finish up with a a positive uh, conversation. It's been a very positive with you as well. Uh, talk to us about what are some of the signs of, you know, we've all been part of a, whether it's a friend or a family member or a coworker, we have those uplifting, just joyful conversations. What's some of the signs that, that we look for or so some that we can learn? We all know them because we have them with people, but what do you see as uh, maybe three signs of, of great uplifting conversation? Well, it's interesting you should say that, and I want to hear your, your examples as well. Um, my husband had a, a, one of the best conversations he's ever had in his life an hour before this call. Mm -hmm. So I got to see in someone, my husband, who's been working on a project for 20 years. It's a cancer research project, and he got off the phone with people that are going to be investing in this company. He said, I, he walked around the room, and he was saying, I cannot believe how good I feel. I cannot <laughs> believe this is like like I wrote my book and it took 50 years to get this published. I mean, I literally wake up in the middle of the night saying, I cannot believe that this book is published. It's that feeling that your aspiration has come to life. That was so strong in him. And he said, I can't stop thinking about this. I can't believe it's happened. You know, so it's that joy that it's a confirmation. These conversations confirm who we are, what we're all about, our identity, our purpose. And it's in it just, he, he said the, the I talk about it as the chemical high. It's like a cocktail. It doesn't mm -hmm. disappear. It will right. have a shelf life that will that will go on and on and on. The more we think about it and the more we share it, it's that oxytocin flood of other people are connecting with my dream and they want to be part of it. And we're all going to do this together. So it's that we feeling that he had. I've, I've not seen him. I mean, I've known him my whole life, but I've not seen him excited, excited like this in a long time. So 
it's that kind of energy. I don't know if I said three things, but... but no, I, I, I can certainly, you know, it's, it's... And I think you talk about it also in your materials that the part of it, like having those conversations with someone who is not analyzing us or judging us or right. putting some stickers on us and telling us how we should live our life or what we're not doing well or... Yeah. Um, it's those flow, having conversation flow where someone is right there with you and you feel like... That person is not judging me. They're accepting me for who I am. That's right. It's it's that's probably one of the biggest cores that I call it. There, there are a couple things. It's listening to connect, not reject. The human beings absolutely thrive when people listen to connect, not reject. Um, and then getting to really experience the other person, stepping into their shoes and sharing a joy with them or sharing a fear with them, but but doing it from a compassionate place from an empathetic place. Boy, does that feel good. Does that feel good, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, I'd be curious to hear all of your, your comments. What are the three things, Dan and Sherry? What are, what are your things that make a conversation so great for you? Um, you uh, well, you go, go ahead, Dan. Oh, yeah. Ladies first. You go first. Ladies I'll first. you first. Then, then I'll have to top it, right? We're switching this is, this it now. Men go first. No, it's, this is what we call first. shared leadership. Yeah. All right, so. Men, men go first. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm old. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what in in a great conversation? What are some things that for you? <laughs> that to, to me, what makes a great conversation yeah. is when the other person is doing eighty percent or more of the talking, mm -hmm. and I and I'm listening, mm -hmm. uh, because that that yeah, the best conversations I guess is when I hardly talk at all, and I'm just listening to the other person, and then they go away, and you hear them saying. Man, that was the best you know conversation I ever had, and they were doing all the talking, so they were expressing themselves and their yeah. ideas, yep. and they felt empowered just by being in the conversation. Right. Uh, so uh, to me, that's uh, that that's the biggest. I I can't think of other two right now. So mm. go ahead, Jerry. Well, uh, I can. Uh, I w went to a meeting one time that was. Um, with leaders and these people have been leaders for quite some time and to me uh, just the way everybody dumped their ego at the door we all had the same we all have the same values we all had the same focus the same uh, vision and the whole room just even the electricity in the room uh, and the conversation going around was uh, just incredible because we were all feeding off each other. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, because we were all there for the same reason. Yep. Yep. Sherry, I gave that uh, type of conversation an, a term. As you know, I make up terms. And uh, uh, I, it, I call that co creating conversations where you're feeding each other. And your minds, I really believe that what happens now we see that when those conversations occur, we're actually writing new thoughts on each other's brains. We walk away from that conversation having a new piece of insight or wisdom. You used the word wisdom earlier, Tal. And that's, we have a new type of wisdom. It's, it's scribed now on our hearts. It's scribed on our minds. It's such a wonderful thing. It's, um, yeah, it's a giving to each other so much more. So. Great. Well, listen, I, I think I'm going to get you to be my co-producer or interviewer because you asked the great questions as well. So I, I appreciate the, the oh. feedback and conversation. So, um, okay, we, we are uh, actually excited that we had you on the show and hopefully we'll do this more in, in the future with you because you seem to be a, an amazing guest, very engaged into this, these topics, and so it's refreshing to, to have you on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to give a gift to all your listeners, if I could. Sure. I'm going to send you a link. Since we talked about the difficult conversations and conflict avoidance and things like that, I'm going to send you a link with three articles in it. Um, I was worked for three months with uh, Joanne Lublin from the Wall Street Journal, and the article came out two weeks ago um, about conflict avoiders, and I think it's a phenomenal article because it does a lot of good research. Beside what I had to say, Joanne did a great job. Great, and, and and share with us before we leave your. I know you've got a couple of websites, but yep. I know I'm a big fan of all of them. But if you want to share them with our viewers as well, yeah, the one that I'd like to send all of you to, uh, if you're interested in learning more about conversational intelligence, is www. 
conversationalintelligence.com. And there are great resources there that help you um, better understand how to build conversational intelligence into organizations and, and relationships, including videos and so forth. The other is creatingwe.com, creatingwe.com, which is named after my first big bestseller book, Creating We. So those are my two. And also, just I know she didn't leave this one out, Leadership Excellence articles are um, top-of-the-line leadership material uh, if anybody wants to get their hands on. But Judith, uh, thank you so much. Stay on for just a second. We're just going to stop the live uh, okay. performance, so hang on for just a minute. But thank you so sure. much. You're, right. You're you, quite Judith. welcome. Thank you. Great Cal. to be with all of you. Yes, Cal, great. before we sign off, okay. may I? Yes. I want to invite everybody that's watching right now to join the Lead with Giants community by going to leadwithgiants.com, click on join now, and you'll see how to connect, engage, serve, learn, and lead with others who are interested in helping leaders become better leaders. So I hope to see you around the community. Great. And that, that way, uh, Tao will know the numbers correctly next time, how many members we have in the community. So. <laughs> You have to get each one, count them up, Tal. But yeah, I, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go ahead and stop here. But hang on, Judith, don't leave us, okay? Okay, sure. <laughs>